Faith and Victory Church. So glad to have you all with us tonight. We're um, continuing in our series on the Bible in the light of our redemption. <laughs> Jesse, what in the world? <laughs> oh, my. My staff is over here cracking up. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. God is good. And there we go. We're trying to get everything set up here. You want a new setup tonight and um, wanted to see how it works. And um, going with a um, new podcast microphone. And uh, <clears throat> praise the Lord. We're, we're just testing out some stuff here and uh, getting ready for uh, new things and more glorious things in Jesus' name. Let's jump right on in. We're on lesson number nine. Again, we are using the Bible in the light of our redemption by E.W. Kenyon. You may acquire this study book from either Amazon.com or Walmart.com. Um, I would encourage you to get that and follow with us. We really, we really, we really believe this would be a great uh, book to have in your library, and um, it would it would bless you and. Um, would um, be a blessing to uh, learn and have this on hand for yourself. Praise the Lord. So again, the Bible at the light of our redemption by E.W. Kenyon. You, you will see when you look online, there'll be a, a smaller blue book version. That is the original version um, uh, from Kenyon Gospel Publishing. They've um, remarketed it in this format, and this is a better format. It's more of a study guide this way. Same material, um, but it's... Um, it is just better laid out than the old book. Um, so I would encourage you to go ahead and get this and add it. Even if you've got the old one, I would encourage you to get this one and go through it fresh and new. <clears throat> um, it'll be a blessing to you. Praise the Lord. In our previous lesson, we saw that God um, entered into a covenant with the children, a uh, covenant relationship with Abraham in order to preserve upon the earth a lineage and a line or a lineage that would be the line for Jesus to come through and make himself a man and redeem mankind. Abraham and his descendants were to be the covenant people of God. And um, so we're, we're excited about uh, studying this and finding out more. Praise the Lord. All right. Um, God says in Genesis 17, 7, I will establish between me and thee and thy seed after thee throughout their generations for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. Through this covenant people, God was giving, was going to send the Redeemer. So this whole this whole line of covenant and these people that would follow after us and that lineage and of covenant would be the Redeemer would come out of that. Genesis 22, 16 to 18. By myself have I sworn, saith Jehovah, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heavens and as the sand which is upon the seashore. And thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies, and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because that thou hast obeyed my voice. The people who were brought into covenant relationship with God were also to be his testimony upon the earth. Palestine was located geographically so that the ancient civilizations had to pass through in their uh, commercial relations with one another. God's covenant people were to be the witness uh, to them of the revelation of the true and the living God. In other words, this geographical location was the center of the trade routes of the world. They just passed through there. And so they, you know, the testimony of the true and the living God, the covenant God can be carried all over the world because their communication in those days was uh, word of mouth by what people had experienced and seen. And there was to, this where God had, had Israel positioned, uh, the covenant people positioned to be right in the middle of that where all the world would come through and learn uh, and hear of the true and the living God. And then ultimately <clears throat> of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Um, after we after we go into the history of Abraham, the the book of Genesis gives us a brief history of his three immediate descendants: Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Of course, Joseph Jacob becomes known as Israel later. Um, 
Genesis can be grouped into five categories. That is Adam, chapters 1 through 5. Noah, chapters 6 through 11. Uh, Abraham, chapters 12 through 26. Jacob, 27 through 37. And Joseph, 35 through 45. Okay? And so let's just get a little bit of summary about the, the main three descendants or the first three uh, generations of descendants. Isaac, um, Kenya says, is the most beautiful of the Old Testament characters. A gentle, quiet spirit. Uh, he left an impression upon Jewish life that no other of the fathers ever gave. His marriage and love for Rebecca is one of the loveliest of the stories uh, of the founders of that wonderful people. Hallelujah. And then you came Jacob, uh, crooked, selfish, shrewd. Uh, it's doubtful that he ever made anyone happy. <laughs> uh, he met God at Jabbok, and there God laid hands upon him, and Jacob was a different man from that day. Uh, he, uh, he had power with God and man. His life proved that God can change the most crooked lives <laughs> and make them straight. Okay? So it took a work of God and him to fix him, but it became Israel. Then Joseph, the beautiful prince. Um, nowhere in literature is there anything to compare with this young boy, man, statesman, founder, and preserver of a nation. The fragrance of his life lingers upon the ages of his, Israel's history. Many boys have made good and strong by the influence of his commanding personality. At the age of 17, Joseph was sold as a slave into Egypt. At 30 years of age, became the ruler of Egypt. And at 40 years old, uh, he, he, with 70 souls, Jacob came into Egypt because of that and preserved the lineage. Hallelujah. <clears throat> so the reason to go into Egypt. The Bible says in Genesis, the second chapter, and God remembered his covenant with Abraham. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad God remembers his covenant? God keeps and is reminded of his covenant. Um, the word remembered there in the Hebrew means to remind, recount, okay? So it's not like he forgot it, uh, but recount. In other words, rehearse again. And uh, the covenant keeping God remembered his promise to Abraham uh, to make of him a great nation, to save his covenant people um, from destruction during the famine that was sweeping the land of Canaan. The covenant God brought them into Egypt from there to thrive and to multiply. Genesis 45, 6 and 7. For two years hath the famine been in the land, and there has been yet five years to that which there is neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to prepare you a remnant in the earth and to save you alive by a great deliverance. God knew all along what he was going to do, and that was to preserve Israel. God used Joseph to preserve his people, he overruled the work of Satan. Because remember, what is it that we remember back from uh, Genesis 3? That God said that there is a seed coming that will bruise your heel. He, you will bruise his heel and he will bruise your head. God he said there's a coming seed and Satan has been ever after that looking towards the opportunity to destroy that seed. In Genesis 45, 8, so it says, so now it was not you that sent me hither, but God. And he hath made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house and a ruler throughout all the land of Egypt. So his brothers had sold him into slavery, but he said, don't worry about it. God sent me ahead to preserve a nation. God sent me ahead to preserve a people, to preserve a line. Hallelujah. In, in, in accordance with the covenant of our forefather, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and now me, Joseph, God has preserved a line. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Can you, can you say amen out there? <clears throat> what a picture it is uh, of the faithfulness and loving care of God who said 
uh, when he entered into covenant with Abraham, by myself have I sworn in Genesis 22, 16. God made a covenant promise that his seed would be as the sand of the seashore and the stars of the heaven, that they would be to him a people. He would be their God. And that covenant promise, God would, would, was, uh, was necessary for God to do things along the way to preserve that line Glory to God. I said, glory to God. The children of Israel thrived uh, among um, the ease and abundance uh, of, the, of the land that they lived in. They were favored settlers. The best of the land had been bestowed upon them. They held honorable and well-paid positions under the Egyptian kings. We can find that in Genesis 47, 1 through 12, and verse 27. Uh, they... they uh, Joseph had been so honored because he saved Egypt, but he also saved Israel. He had saved Egypt um, from the absolute destruction of the famine because of because he walked with God. That they had just he had been honored and honored and honored. But then there arose, arose a Pharaoh who knew not um, Joseph. And with all that favor, eventually they entered into captivity and bondage. So above all, the favor of God was upon them. He was keeping his covenant with Abraham and the word that he spoke, saying his seed should be as the multitude of the stars of the heaven and the sands of the seashore. The increase they had was marvelous. God made them a great nation so that they would be his witness upon the earth. This scripture is repeated uh, is in repeated statements directs our attention to the marvelous growth of God's covenant people. Uh, Exodus 1-7. The children of Israel were faithful and increased abundantly and multiplied and waxed exceedingly and the land was filled with them. In the 210 years in which Israel was were in Egypt, their number increased from 70 to more than 3 million. Now, uh, chronology tells us that 210 years Two and ten years were spent in Egypt, and uh, on the surface appears uh, to be uh, contradictory to the normal 430 years people talk about uh, in, in Exodus 1240. But uh, the Septuagint translates the words, the sojourning of Israel while they sojourned in the land of Egypt and the land of Canaan, 430 years. So uh, that would make it. That would, that would reconcile that difference. Je Galatians 3, 16, 17, the even there's light upon this, showing the period began to be reckoned from the date of the promise of Abraham to the deliverance of the children, which makes precisely 430 years. There passed between the entering of the Can land of Canaan and the birth of Isaac, 25 years, from the birth of Isaac to the birth of Jacob, 60 years. Jacob was 130 when he entered Egypt. The whole interval amounts to 220 years. 210 years added to that number makes 430 years. 430 years was the sojourning from Abraham to the to the deliverance from Egypt. You see, as they began to increase and increase in the land, then persecution came. Satan recognized the favor of God upon them and was determined to not let God's plan of the head busting redeemer show up. <clears throat> so we saw in our last lesson how that Satan worked to destroy the seed of the woman through the promised through whom the promised redeemer was to come. That redeemer had been specified as the seed of Abraham. Satan seeks to destroy God's people. Now he knows where the line is. He knows who the line is. It's Abraham's line. After 100 years in Egypt, during which the Israelites had grown into a mighty people, Satan began to seek to destroy them. Um, he, Satan put fear in the hearts of the statesmen of Egypt, an ill-grounded fear that the Israelites, who were so mighty number, would join themselves to the enemies of Egypt in a time of war. And you find that in Exodus chapter 1. So they began to fear the, the uh, Israelis, who had been nothing but favorable to them, <clears throat> and had dwelt at peace with them. But see, Satan stirs things up. 
If you don't think that the racial tensions right now going on and all this teaching about all this racial stuff is not Satan inspired your heads in the sand. The vast, vast, vast majority of people I know and have contact with, with all races, don't have bitterness and hatred and racism towards one another. Are there races in the world? Of course. But the vast majority of people I know are not. But you hear people talk, every human being on the planet um, of certain races is a, is a racist. Well, see, that's fear. Satan does that. Just like he did the Egyptians. He made them afraid of Israel simply because they were being blessed. Then they followed the counsels of systematic oppression and enslavement, uh, determined tyranny and cruelty. The increase, however, of Israel was part of the divine plan of his covenant people. And all they were doing could not stop them from multiplying and growing. The more they afflicted them, the more they multiplied and grew. The more they persecute the church, the more it multiplies and grows. Bring on the persecution because we just multiply and grow. We get stronger. The treatment of the slaves from the Egyptians was sometimes horrible. Uh, mutilations, tortures were inflicted upon the Israelis. Every, uh, even the command to kill every son uh, be cast into the river. Well, they wanted to stop male reproduction. Without the males, they couldn't reproduce. So they wanted to stop that. Okay? The person of Israel received so, was so great, they cried to God, uh, to the God of the covenant for deliverance. And again, God heard their cry and remembered his covenant with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Hallelujah. The covenant-keeping God, Jehovah, came down to deliver his people from the bondage. In Exodus 3, 5, and 6, it says, and he said, do not, uh, draw not nigh, wow, let me get this right. Love the King Jimmy, you get tongue-tied sometime. Draw not nigh hither, put off thy shoes off thy feet, for the place whereon thou standest is holy ground. Moreover, he said, I am the God of thy father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. Hallelujah. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Think about that. God's reminding. He gives us three generations. Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Later be Israel. <clears throat> the second chapter of Exodus gives us the birth of Moses and his life until the end, until the time of his call. Now, something very important here. The hiding of baby Moses at the river's bank by his mother and his later reunification, a renunciation, not reunification, his later renunciation of Egypt were not rash acts. This is what the scripture says because it's based upon faith in the covenant keeping God. Hebrews 11, 23 and 24, and then verse 27. Uh, by faith, Moses, when he was born, was hid three months by his parents. Wow. By faith, Moses, when he was grown up, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. And then by faith, he forsook Egypt not fearing the wrath of the king. It was all acts of faith. Not acts of fear. Acts of faith. In the covenant keeping God. Now you cannot use Cecil B. DeMiles, the Ten Commandments, for your biblical accuracy on these things. Great movie i have it i have the i have the um the not designer pack but the um collector's, collector's edition with the 10 commandments in it and all this stuff love the movie but biblically accurate as far as uh doctrine you can't go by it you gotta go by the bible um so hallelujah 
The third and fourth chapters of Exodus give us the call of Moses, including the story of the burning bush. The revelation of God to him in his plans for delivering the Israelites. Moses' hesitancy, hesitancy to respond and the permission for Aaron to accompany him. We notice there that the power God gave to Moses' rod where he might perform miracles. We notice that God manifested himself to Moses not only as the covenant-keeping God, but as the miracle-working God. In Exodus 4, 20 and through 26, the revelation of the importance of the blood covenant uh, is revealed. Moses, now this is where Moses was on his way to um, tell Pharaoh that the firstborn of Egypt was going to be killed and the angel of the Lord met him to kill him. Exodus 4, 24. And it was because he had not circumcised his own son. He had failed to even hope his end of the bargain. And of course, his wife immediately circumcises the son on the spot. And, um, and uh, God did you know, God didn't with, didn't kill him, but he was coming to kill him because he was a covenant breaker. He was about to pronounce covenant on uh, judgment on other people that he himself had not done. So in our next lesson, we'll become spectators of the mightiest conflict in history, and that is um, that's the between the powers and wealth of, of Egypt. Uh, the learning, the pride, the confidence, the education, it's God's. And on the other hand, a poor, weak, aged, broken, and discredited man who only had one follower, his brother. It's no formal procession that these two might make as they pass through the palace gates and ask an audience for the king and the lighthearted, witty Egyptians must have enjoyed many a jest at their expense. But there was a heart of astonishment behind all that laughter. What generation had ever witnessed anything like that? Two slaves demanding liberty, not for themselves, but for three million people. Demanding it again and again, and after repeated refusal from Pharaoh, the God King of the mightiest civilization of the day. And we see all that laughter died down before the persistency of these men. And that the astonishment turns to fear. Their cheeks pale and heart trembles at the sound of their steps. These two blood covenant men hold the fate of Egypt in their hand and leave written upon the land words that live when, when its greatness had passed away. Before we study the exit of the children of Israel out of Egypt, it will help us to note some facts concerning Egyptian kings. A prince in mounting the throne in Egypt was, so to speak, transfigured in the eyes of his subjects. So in the mind of the Egyptians, Pharaoh was a god-man. Um, Lyndon Morant writes, We may imagine what prestige such an exaltation of royalty gave in Egypt to its sovereign power. The Egyptians, in the eyes of the king, were but trembling slaves compelled from religious motives to execute his orders blindly. Worship was addressed to Pharaoh as to divinity. His ministers, and he occupied two different platforms. He sits apart and alone. When he speaks, the matter is judged. It is to him alone that God's demand is addressed, and on him the responsibility of refusal and continual injustice is laid. So now we understand why Pharaoh sends forth as one man in all Egypt with whom the deliverer of the Israelites have controversy. Such words as these take on new significance when they're set forth in light of these facts. I'm going to read from Exodus 8, verses 10, 22, and 23. That thou, Pharaoh, mayest know that there is none like unto Jehovah our God. And I was set apart in that day the land of Goshen, in which my people dwell, there that no swarms of flies shall be there, to the end that thou mayest know that I am Jehovah in the midst of the earth. 
and I will put a division between my people and thy people. God and his people are on one side. Pharaoh and his people are on the other side. It is a contest between the true and the living God and a pretender. God has to break the idol to pieces and lay the idol low to deliver his people. Now remember when the, the thing that Abraham said when um, he's with God, God's telling him to go to tell, let Pharaoh let his people go. He says, who shall I tell Pharaoh sent me? And the King James says it this way, say that I am that I am sent you. Okay. Well, in our thinking, we don't really get that. But you understand in the in the Eastern mind and understand that Pharaoh thought he was a king. The, the literal Hebrew really says it better this way. Instead, I am that I am. It really says, I exist because I exist. <laughs> I mean, I exist just because I exist. I'm eternal. I am the true God. I am the everlasting. The ancient of days. He who has existed forever. I exist because I exist. You are a pretender. And see what they would do in, in, um, in, the, um, in, in Egypt is when one pharaoh would die, they, they, all would, they would dress them alike. And the common purpose did not know that there had been a change of power because he was a deity, he was a god. So he just kept, they, they, they presented the idea of perpetuation. And Moses shows them and says, um, just so you know, the one that exists because he exists has sent me to tell you, you fake, you pretender, let my people go. And of course, Pharaoh's got pride, arrogance. He's used to everything he says has to be done because the people see him as a God man. And so all the plagues of Egypt are plagues against the gods of Egypt. And God destroys the image of that one by one until he finally just kills even up to the firstborn son of Pharaoh throughout all the land. God says, you tell Pharaoh, I exist because I exist has sent you. Hallelujah. Not, hey, I'm God, I'm the big guy. You know, it's just, I'm the creator. I'm the everything. When there was nothing before, I remember I lived, lived Jesus in in, uh, in in the Gospels. They said, uh, "We have Abraham to our father." Um, he said, "Before Abraham, I am." Using that phraseology, I exist, and they were ready to kill him because he said he made himself God. Hallelujah! Let's look at our questions for tonight, and. Um, now explain. Now, once again, I, 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 these questions are in the back of the book. You can go. You go through the chapter. And you can get get the answers. I really encourage you to get this book, the Basic Bible Course, called "The Bible in the Light of Our Redemption" by E. W. Kenyon. Doctor Kenyon has been. Oh, he passed away in the fifties, uh, uh, um, but tremendous revelation uh, in the Word of God, and such a blessing his uh, his writings continue to be, and. Um, but explain the place, the geographic, uh, geographically, the Israelites had held as a witness. And uh, Palestine was located, here's the answer, Palestine was located so that the ancient civilizations had to pass through it in their commercial relationships with one another. Israel was to be witness to them of the revelation of the true and the living God. Hallelujah. So they were at the crossroads of the world. And trade routes all went right through there, and they were to be witnesses of the true of the living God. Uh, and giving a brief character sketch of Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. Isaac was the gentle, quiet spirit. Jacob was crooked, selfish, and shrewd. God touched him, he became Israel. And then Joseph was the statesman, founder, and preserver, 
of a nation. How did God use Joseph to preserve his people? By making him a ruler in Egypt so that when his brethren came to him, he could preserve his family. What was the life of, like for the Israelites before the persecution began in Egypt? Man, they lived with ease and abundance. They were favored. The best of the land was bestowed upon them. They held honorable, well-paid positions under the Egyptian kings. What caused the statesmen of Egypt to oppress the children? Why did he do this? You really should be saying, or who, I said who, I said what? Who caused the statesmen of Egypt to oppress the children of Israel, and why did he do this? Well, the answer is Satan. And why? He wanted to destroy God's covenant people. Because if he could stop the line, Messiah could not come. The Redeemer could not come. Upon what were based the hiding of Moses by his parents and his later renunciation of Egypt. In other words, were they afraid? Did Moses, you know, um, renounce Egypt because this or that? Both were acts of faith in the covenant keeping God. The Bible says so. The Bible says by faith, his parents hid him. By faith, he, he, he uh, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. Why did God come down to deliver the Israelites? God came down to deliver Israel because he heard their cry and remembered his covenant with Abraham. Glory to God. Now Abraham, think of this now, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, and the other 11 brothers. So this is dad, those 12 tribes, dad, granddad, great-granddad, great-great-granddad. So the great, great, great grandchildren, great, 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 great grandchildren of Abraham are in captivity and bondage, being persecuted, and God remembers his covenant with Abraham and begin and sends a deliverer to redeem them. Why did God seek to kill Moses? Uh, he failed to circumcise his firstborn. He was on his way to the Egyptians with a message about the fate of their firstborn, non-covenant children, and Moses had not even... Uh, Circumcised his own son. I think she says, you're a bloody husband to me. Um, and circumcises the son. And um, they, they probably had some marriage problems at that moment. Um, who were involved in, uh, in the mighty conflict that took place in the deliverance of Israel and Egypt? God and his people on one side. And Pharaoh and his on the other. And guess who wins? And why was it that God had to humble Pharaoh? Because Pharaoh was considered a God man. Pharaoh was considered to be what the Redeemer had to be. A deity to whom worship was addressed as a divinity. And that God had to show that there was only one that was coming and one that could hold that place and hold that position. And do that work. Praise the Lord. Amen. Amen. So next week we'll get into our next lesson. And um, you know. So, some of these lessons go along. Like I think uh, last week. We did everything we could to get it done in the time. We got done a little bit earlier tonight. Uh, some lessons are shorter than others. But next week we'll get into. Uh, two weeks we'll get into the wanderings. Next week is the deliverance from Egypt. So we'll get into the plagues and all that next week. Um now, go watch the Ten Commandments and watch the plagues. They're cool. Okay? You know, but, uh, you know, we'll, we'll get into the deliverance from Egypt next week. And after that, the um, the wandering in the wilderness. Hallelujah. All this is working towards one thing, bringing a Messiah on the scene. Praise the Lord. Hope our sound audio was really good, to, was better tonight. Okay, good. Um, we, um, we we tried something different, and... Um, Praise the Lord, and we trust that was you got blessed by it. I'm kind of happy. I don't have to think. I'm not kind of hooked up and wired up and that kind of stuff. And um, 
Praise the Lord. All right. Well, listen, don't forget this weekend. Hallelujah. Church at 10 o'clock at New Life Family Church. We're having a joint service. Faith and Victory Church is joining New Life Family Church at 6701 Ken Coy Road, uh, Jamestown. It's a Jamestown address. Although it's actually in High Point. It has a Jamestown at, uh, a delivery address. Um, we're having our, our joint service. I'm preaching. Our worship team's leading worship. And then after the service, we're doing uh, my famous Big Dogs Down East uh, barbecue and fried chicken. Hallelujah. And um, I worked at a particular restaurant down there. If you were lit from down there and you're listening, you know the big, big one in Greenville. Hallelujah. The big one. Not the, not the, uh, what people may say, what's the best one, but the biggest one. Hallelujah. And um, we're cooking that, that barbecue and fried chicken. Um, we've bought, we've modified it over the years. So it's, it's not, it's mine now. It's not the same. It's not exactly the same anymore. It's been modified enough that, and, and different enough that it, it's my own recipes. Um, but it's Eastern style barbecue and, and coleslaw and boiled potatoes, and fried chicken, glory to God. Hallelujah. Uh, and corn stick, cornbread sticks. Come on out and uh, it won't cost you anything to eat there. Uh, now, if you take stuff, if you come and take stuff away, you got to pay for it. But eating there is it's free. Hallelujah! Listen, um, we sure love you. I want to remind you of these uh, words from uh, the Apostle John in his first letter, where he says in chapter five, verse four, "And whatsoever is born of God overcometh the world." And this is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. We love you. God bless you. See you next time here at Faith and Victory Church online.